This video is sponsored by Babbel, the best-selling language learning app. Me and Mehdi released two videos at the same time giving different explanations for the chain fountain. The person with the correct explanation gets 10,000 Canadian cents from the other person. Judging by the comment section, Mehdi made the more convincing video. Damn it. Some commenters said that not only was his explanation correct, but his approach was better. He came up with hypotheses and tested those hypotheses, whereas I was just interested in trying to break a world record. And frankly, that is a fair criticism. So I am back with some hypotheses and some tests for those hypotheses and some simulations. I did offer to concede the wager based on the fact that more people were convinced by Mehdi's video, but he very graciously refused, saying that the wager should be decided based on science. The crux of our disagreement is the fact that I think for the chain to rise up in a fountain, there must be an extra kickback force from the pot on the chain as it's lifted from the pot. But but Mehdi doesn't think that extra force is required. For more details about that disagreement, you can watch the original videos, the links are in the description and in the card. To prove his point, Mehdi put together this ingenious test. The beads on this chain are really spaced out, which removes any kickback force. And yet, look, here's the mold effect. But actually, what you see here is quite different to what you see with the normal bead chain. With normal chain, it starts off as a dribble and grows into a chain fountain on its own. Whereas in Mehdi's test, he imparts the shape of a chain fountain to the chain at the beginning by hand. And that fountain then slowly decreases in height under the influence of gravity. So my argument is that this isn't a demonstration of the chain fountain. What it does demonstrate is that a chain will flow through the shape that you give it. And that shape would be maintained in the absence of gravity. In the presence of gravity, the shape that you give the chain collapses over time. The fact that a chain flows through its own length in this way is an important part of the explanation, but we also need to explain how the regular type of B chain is able to rise up against gravity and stay there. I think it's good actually to split the explanation into two parts like this. We need to explain first how a chain moving through its own length will maintain its shape in the absence of an external force like gravity or friction, and we need to explain how the fountain is able to rise up on its own. Let's tackle the first part of the explanation. Look, here's another demonstration on a horizontal surface. So there's no issue with gravity here. As I pull the chain around, it moves through the shape that I give it. Actually, the shape does collapse a little bit, presumably because of friction in this case, as opposed to gravity. For an intuitive explanation of this behavior, you can think about it in terms of waves. Like if I whip this chain, the wave travels down the chain. But if the chain were to be traveling in this direction at exactly the same speed as the wave was traveling in this direction, then the wave would appear to be fixed in space with the chain moving through it. Interestingly, when you look at the mathematics of a chain falling off a table, the wave speed matches the chain speed. So when Mehdi whips the chain in this experiment, the wave he creates travels in this direction, and the chain travels in this direction. The end result is that that wave is fixed in space. So that's the first part of the explanation, but what about the second part? How does the fountain rise up on its own? Well, that was the subject of my previous video, I think that the chain rises up against gravity and can hold there because of an additional kickback force from the pot. But let's just look back at Mehdi's spaced out bead chain experiment. He actually has his own explanation for why the chain fountain decreases over time in his test. He puts text on screen to say that it's because the chain is slowing down and he needs a higher drop for a higher speed. So I've set up the same experiment with spaced out beads and an eight meter drop, and I've marked every 10th bead with black marker so we can see from the video how fast the chain is going at different parts during the test. It's my hypothesis that even if the chain increases in speed over the course of the test, the fountain that I impart manually by hand at the beginning will still decrease over the course of the test due to gravity. According to Mehdi's theory, under those circumstances, the chain fountain wouldn't drop over time. Well, clearly, the fountain does decrease in height over the course of this test, but how is the speed changing? Well, if we count from this frame towards the start of the test, it takes about 40 frames to get through 50 beads. 
And if you count from this frame towards the end of the test, it takes about 30 frames to get through 50 beads. So throughout the duration of the test, the speed of the chain is increasing. And yet, the fountain that I imparted manually at the beginning still decreases in height. In general though, if you could demonstrate a very flexible chain rising above the pile on its own, that would be strong evidence against my explanation. And it's important in science to try and prove yourself wrong, which is why I tried to recreate Medi's test in the first place using longer chain and a higher drop. But so far, I haven't seen a fountain. But if you wanna try the test for yourself with an even longer chain from an even higher drop, then please do send me the video, maybe post it on my subreddit. By the way, with the explanation broken down into two parts like this, it's worth looking at the history of our understanding of it. Because the first part of the explanation has been known for a while. This textbook from 1860 talks about chains maintaining their shape when flowing in steady state. It's only the second part that's new, the fact that a chain can rise up on its own. That's why, for me, that is the mold effect. That's the chain fountain. I wanted to take a closer a look at one particular experiment of Medi's that seemed to be really persuasive for people. It's this horizontal setup where the chains in the pile are spaced out like this. Actually, I'm just gonna rotate this video to vertical. That way we can talk about up and down on the screen and it's equivalent to up and down when we're doing the experiment for real. That way everything's nice and analogous. With the chain spaced out like this, there can't be any reaction force from the pile as the chain is picked up. It doesn't have anything to push against. So I would argue that what we're seeing here is a chain maintaining its shape. It's the first part of the explanation. The fountain doesn't actually grow. It does appear to grow in height, but that's just because the top of the pile is receding in this direction. If you look at the peak of the fountain, it doesn't get any higher. It actually moves down slightly, probably due to friction. So I wanted to set up this test for myself. In one version, the pile of chain is spaced out, and in the other version, the pile of chain is bunched up. I also wanted to control the speed a bit better, so it was the same in both tests. So instead of just grabbing the chain and running with it, I've created this motorized spool. I say motorized spool, it's a tube attached to a drill. It's my hypothesis that in the bunched up case, the peak of the fountain will actually rise up, and in the spaced out case, it will actually recede downwards. And look, that's exactly what we see. Here are those two tests again, but this time with an object representing the lip of a beaker. To me, this suggests that for the chain to rise higher than its starting point, there needs to be a kickback force from the pile. And as before, you can see the recoil of the stationary chain quite clearly. Something that's been really helpful in the making of this video is the Steve Mould subreddit. I'll leave a link to that in the description. It's a great place to discuss the sorts of things that I talk about in my videos. But when I posted the chain fountain video, it sparks loads of debate, people posting new ideas and stuff like that, including some simulations of the mold effect. This simulation by Martin Burt is a rigid body simulation and it really shows the importance of the flexibility of the chain. On the left, the maximum bend between two adjacent beads is 20 degrees, and on the right, the maximum bend is 90 degrees. You can see that borne out in the loops of chain at either side of the pot. On the left, those loops are large. On the right, the loops are small. The less flexible chain on the left exhibits the chain fountain effect, the more flexible chain on the right does not. I asked Martin if it was possible to extract information about the forces involved, because I wanted to see if there really was this kickback force from the pot. And he produced this animation here, where you can see the force on the bottom of the container from each bead. And look, as each bead is picked up, there's a spike in the force. And of course, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so the bead feels a force from the pot. I also wanted to see if it was possible to kill that kickback force in the simulation to see if it kills the fountain. One way to do that is to just remove the bottom of the pot. Of course, if you remove the bottom of the pot, then the beads will just fall through. You have to remove gravity as well. So in this simulation, halfway through, the bottom of the pot is removed and the area in red has gravity turned off. Look, you can see the chain moving downwards. There's nothing there for it to kick against. There's no reaction force. And so the fountain slowly recedes. Here's the simulation again, but with the floor of the pot removed from the beginning and the fountain never happens.
This simulation by Richter Sfinger, instead of being a rigid body simulation, considers the chain to be springy, like it resists being bent, like this. And we see that when the chain has some stiffness in this way, when it resists being bent, then we see a chain fountain. But if there is no stiffness, if it's completely flexible, then there is no chain fountain. Richter also plotted the force felt by the base of the pot. Look, this baseline force here is just the weight of the chain pushing down on the pot. And obviously that weight slowly goes down as the chain leaves the pot, which is why there's a slight gradient here. But in addition to that, there are these spikes or at least there are spikes in the left-hand chain where there is stiffness. Each of those spikes represents the extra force on the pot each time a bead is pulled up from the pile. In the fully flexible chain, there is no force and therefore there is no fountain. From these simulations, it does seem as though a force from the pot is required to raise the fountain. It is worth saying though that simulations are tools. And they're only useful tools in so far as they do a good job of representing the real world. So it's good to exercise caution. And actually, I'll link to the source code for these two simulations in the description if you want to take a look. In the paper by Biggins and Warner, they suggest that the stiffness of the chain leads to a levering effect. So it seems sensible to model the chain as a series of rods joined by flexible links. In other words, loads of little levers. It's interesting though that if you actually build that, the fountain doesn't work particularly well. Atomic Shrimp made an interesting video where he explores, among other things, the smooth way that the chain moves. The inflexibility of the chain leads to this smooth motion that perhaps reduces things like knotting and tangling, whereas in an actual chain of rods, the tangling is very present. I managed to find this chain whose movement is even more limited than the bead chain. You can hardly bend it at all, really. And look, the chain fountain is quite pronounced, even in this short length of chain. If the important thing is stiffness, then we should expect to see the mold effect in any chain or rope or string that has stiffness. And actually, we do see it under certain circumstances. Check out this video from YouTube channel, How Not To Highline. See how this rope develops a fountain. At this point, you might be thinking, well, if the stiffness of the chain is so important, how does it work with regular bead chain? Because regular bead chain is really flexible. Look how much I can pinch it. Like I can't pinch it completely flat, but like that's a really tight curve. But actually what's interesting with bead chain is when it's under tension and you try and curve it, the maximum curvature is much lower. Or in other words, the smallest loop size is much higher. So that probably plays an important role. Thinking about alternative mechanisms that might produce an upward force from the pot, Reddit user TNB1K produced this video that shows that when you have a loop of chain on the ground and you pull from one side, as the loop untangles, you get a kick up. To amplify that effect, they created this series of figure eight loops. And look how high the fountain goes. Isn't that impressive? You know, seeing as this thing is already made, I might as well try it out on the actual, you know, beads in a pot, see how high we can get the fountain. The title of this video is somewhat adversarial, but actually having this disagreement has been really enjoyable, and that's thanks to Mehdi. If you haven't checked out his channel, Electro Boom, already, you really should. Also check out Atomic Shrimp's channel and the How Not to Highline channel. All those links are in the description. <laughs> My kids speak much better Spanish than I do, by a long way, because their mum speaks Spanish and because they went to a nursery where everyone speaks Spanish. It's kind of embarrassing. So I've decided I'm going to learn Spanish. I'm going to do it using the sponsor of this video, Babbel. Babbel is a language learning app. It's not just because it's embarrassing. It's because I want to be able to support and encourage their continued learning of Spanish. I don't want them to lose that language that they have. Also, I want to be part of the conversations that they have with my 
wife. You know, my excuse was always like, I'm dyslexic, I find it hard to learn things by rote, so I can't learn a new language because of the vocabulary. But you know what? But okay, like if you want to learn something by rote, like vocabulary, then the absolute best way to do it is with something called spaced repetition. Aprendo español. Aprendo español. Special repetition is the scientifically proven way to learn something by rote. And special repetition is built into Babbel. And they've integrated it in a really thoughtful way. Like I've never really tried space repetition until now. And I've been really surprised at how quickly I've been able to learn and retain the vocabulary of Spanish. Of course, it's not just vocabulary, they're teaching you language that you will use in real life, conversational Spanish. What is repetir? Actually, it's a whole ecosystem of different ways of learning. There's live classes, games, podcasts. You know, you can immerse yourself in the language if you want to. The lessons are 10 to 15 minutes long and the lessons are created by real professional language teachers. And if you do one lesson a day, you could be speaking a new language in just three weeks. Viewers of this channel can get up to 65% off with my special URL. The link is in the description, so check out Babbel today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video next.